I'd like to start my talk tonight by going actually into the news in the past week. Uh, this week, there was a gentleman in the news by the name of Dinesh Kumar. And uh, Mr. Kumar uh, was in the news because 19 years ago, he was uh, arrested, tried, and convicted of uh, killing his own child. And he spent time in prison for that and was obviously greatly affected. Uh, part of the process of the trial and the conviction, uh, and one of the determining factors that brought him uh, to a guilty verdict, was the alleged expert testimony of a, uh, a forensic pathologist by the name of Dr. Charles Smith. And if you know anything about what's been going on with Dr. Charles Smith, uh, he uh, was at the time sort of the star expert witness when it came to these matters. And if he testified something after doing an autopsy, it was considered gold. Well, it turns out that Dr. Smith made a lot of mistakes. So much so that people began to realize his mistakes, go back into his uh, assessments and realize that many people who were once guilty were in fact innocent. And Mr. Kumar was one of them. It's hard to imagine the tragedy that happens after 20 years of, of living with that guilt knowing you're innocent. And you can only imagine what it's like and obviously Dr. Smith has some accounting to do. Now I bring that up because in the, the fight over climate change, this ongoing battle for the hearts and minds of people, there are Dr. Smiths out there on the side of the naysayers and the skeptics who are in, infiltrating public opinion with incorrect ideas and half-truths and fallacies that have really wound up confusing the whole debate. We're really witnessing right now a, a war for the hearts and minds that pretty much has less to do with science and more to do with spin. It's more about who can deliver the more convincing message than who actually has the science right. And you know, to, to get this out of the way, the science that's there is compelling and it's true if you read any scientific legitimate journal, peer-reviewed, not Fox News, not Glenn Beck, not right-wing blogospheres, the science is absolutely convincing that climate change is man-made, it is real, and we are facing serious consequences as a result. On one side of the argument and of the debate, we have you know, the alarmists, the educators who are using the tactics such as what I'm doing, what I do across the country when I speak for the Climate Project can, and that's raising awareness and making you understand. Well, what the other side, the skeptics and the deniers are doing is they're trying to confuse you. They're trying to deliver messages that halt you in your tracks. The weapon that they use is a weapon that's been used before, and it's a very powerful weapon, and it's a weapon that I've had difficulty overcoming. It's called death. You see, my message, and the message of people like me, is that we have to change. And we all know that we don't like to change. We don't like to change our habits. We don't like to change our, our regular routines. We don't want to get, we don't want to eat better to lose weight. We don't want to do things like that. It's difficult. And typically when we're looking for change, if we see some sort of confusing message out there, something that says we should get better or maybe we shouldn't, we stop. They'll say, we'll say, you know, we've got to change because climate change is real. We've got to adjust our ways. And they'll say, yeah, but I don't know. I heard this, I heard this some radical theory. I heard that you know, really, climate change is when too many left-handers eat pizza on Tuesdays. And I'm left-handed and I eat pizza, so I'm, I'm quick on my own. This is the stuff that they do. In the 60s and 70s, the tobacco industry was famous for using this weapon of doubt and a great effectiveness. This is one of my favorite ads of all time. This is actually, I, this is actually in my doctor's office downtown in St. Lawrence Park. I look at the waiting room. It's an amazing sort of example of how you can spin a message within the media. And, and let's just understand, too, media is different today and becoming more encompassing. If you were to go into the dictionary and actually look up the word media, the actual word media is just the plural of media. Media is just a method to deliver a message. And today, we've got different types of media, left, right, and center. The internet has exploded and, of course, has given a voice to individuals who before didn't. When I grew up, you know, in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you know, there was TV, radio, print, and there was usually some sort of quality control or broadcast standards that regulated and authenticated messages. 
Today in the blogosphere and the internet, there's no due diligence, there's no quality control. If it sounds plausible, it might be true. And this is where we have to become more aware. You see, now I almost have a two-part battle when I'm going out there. Number one, I've got to teach people that this is really happening. And number two, I've got to teach you how the other side is trying to get you to do nothing at all. It's a challenge. I don't ask people to be suspicious of everything they hear, but be aware. We can't work an automatic pilot anymore. And there are challenges that happen when we try to do that. And the big question, of course, is what do we do? If we know what's happening, if we know the battleground, if we know the prize, well, how do people like myself and others who do what I do try to convince the masses that we have to change? When we do need to change, and we do have to accept change, if we have to change our, our, our diets, if we have to change our, our relationships, if we have to change our study habits, if we have to change whatever, including the way our do with climate change and the environment, we're basically dealing with two factors that have to be there. In order to change, we have to have awareness that change is necessary. And I think we're getting to that point where we're pretty well aware of what we need to do. The part B, of course, is we have to have a viable and sustainable motivator by which we continue to propel our change. And that's subjective. What may be a motivator for me may not be a motivator for you, and there's all kinds. There's young people in this audience, it could be career. We can be shifting from the society where we live in an entitlement world, where everyone needs to solve the problem for us, and we're owed, to an ownership. Move over the paradigm to ownership. And imagine if we own that, you, you, you create a major that is, is, is part of the solution. It could be economic, it could be altruistic, it could be legacy. I think it is fair to show you what my motivation is, why I do this, why I continue to do it at every opportunity. I've had epiphanies in my life. I've had moments where my whole life changed. And probably one of the strongest epiphanies, especially relating to this topic right here, happened at exactly 9.34 p.m. on Friday the 26th of July 2002. I became a dad. I became a parent. That's the first picture ever taken of me with my eldest son, who's eight and a half right now, and, and possibly watching online on the website. And if you are, listen to your mom, go to bed soon, okay? <laughs> that reinforcement was, was done again, that epiphany happened again at 8.21 and 8.22 a.m. on Sunday, May 23rd, 2004, when we welcomed our twin sons into the world, Matthew and Jacob, who are now six. Poor Jacob, he had the pink blanket, but that's how hospitals tell him apart, I don't know, whatever it is. And then again, at 4.43 p.m. on Friday, September 4, 2009, we had our first girl. I have four motivating reasons why I have to continue to do this. Because there is an old Native American proverb, we haven't inherited this planet from our ancestors, we're only borrowing it from our children. There's a Chinese proverb, one generation plants the tree, the next gets the shade. It's absolutely irresponsible in my opinion, to be living in a society that exists for the moment. We now have a short-term way of thinking. And it's getting to the point where it's causing great harm for those who are coming after us. We're poised to be the first generation of all mankind that gives the planet away worse than when we got it. And this is, let's get this straight, we're no longer talking about a political issue. This isn't a game. This is a moral issue here. This is an issue where if you think about it, imagine all of the work and the success and the progress that has been taking place for many generations before us, leading up to today. Imagine the fact that we're poised here right now to basically be gluttonous, to take every last little bit of it for ourselves, to use it, to abuse it, to rape and pillage this place, and then look at those generations ahead of us and basically stick our nose at them and say, tough, too bad, so sad. This potential abuse could very well be the largest moral issue mankind has ever seen. This is the issue that we have to deal with. And this is what we have to fight. 
And we can do that. We can move forward. And what we have to do is go forward and imagine ourselves 40 years from now. Let's think about two scenarios. Imagine, or actually I should say, there's, a, there's an old African proverb that, that's effective here too, and I learned this from Mr. Gore. Um, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. The problem is we have to go quickly and we have to go together. We have to go. It's sort of a hybrid we, we, we're at. But if we were to imagine ourselves, say, in a generation from now, let's imagine scenario A, where we've basically seen a deteriorating society, where we have a society that 20, 30, 40 years from now, our resources are depleted, our climate is uninhabitable, we're passing on a place that is far worse. Well, at that time, those who are children and our grandchildren could probably sit us down, and they would have a right to look at us and say, what were you thinking? Did you lack the scientific knowledge? Did you not care? Is that really what it's all about? Is our comfort so strong that for whatever reason we forget that the greater good is far more significant than the perceived greatness of having goods? Or, let's look at scenario B, where we have a regenerating society, a regenerating planet where 40 years from now we found a way instead to figure out how to use renewable resources, to figure out how to replenish the land and the soil, and to curb population growth. We figured out a way to do that, and we did that by standing up. We did that by making ourselves accountable for the problem and taking ownership, regardless of whether we were the creators of it or not. That is the scenario that I want to be a part of, because at that time, then those same children and grandchildren can look at us and say, how did you find the moral courage to do it? Despite all the impediments and the doubters and the naysayers, how did you find that resolve? Well, we did. We made green cool. We made it part of what people wanted to do. We made it part of what people had to do. Because it mattered, not just for us, but for future generations. And you know, there are some people who think that's very hard to do. People think it's darn near impossible. People think it can't be done. And you know what? To those people, I got news for you. It's happened. And it can happen. Because this place, it's the only place we've got, last I checked. It's the place we have to protect. It's the only home we have. And as far as I can see, it's all the time that I have. But I thank you so much. Good night and God bless.